one of my dearest friends in the world. We've known each other now since 1984. Ron Cantor, married to an Israeli believer. They've lived in Israel for years now. He's on the front lines of, of so much of what God is doing. Hey, Ron, great to have you on the air again. It's wonderful to be here, Mike. All right, so, Ron, let's go back to the beginning, growing up as a Jewish kid in Richmond, Virginia. We'll get started. We'll, we'll finish your testimony on the other side of the break here. But, but what was your life like before you were saved? How would you come to faith? Well, I was, um, I don't know if I believe in God or not. I was probably more agnostic than atheist, but I was Jewish. It was like, you know, people said, well, you didn't believe in God. Were you Jewish? Yes, because you, you're Jewish by blood. You're a son of Abraham. And you don't really even know what that means, but you know you're Jewish, you know it's important, and you know that the whole world hates you, uh, and you know what your people have suffered. And that was my culture and identity, even though I wasn't very religious, but I did come to the place where I wondered, is there a God? I, this was after my bar mitzvah. I I stood in front of a thousand people and sang in a language, Hebrew, that I, I didn't understand. Um, I got seven thousand dollars it was worth it uh that's why i did it to be honest and uh but i didn't know god i wasn't thinking about god it was culture it was my people um it was for my parents but it was a little later than that as a as i got older in my teen years that i just began to wonder is there a god all right so you're you're a teenager you're living in the world i imagine at, at that point uh, living in sin, what what's the big thing that now happens? I guess a, a dear friend, also a lifelong friend of mine now, something starts to happen in his life. Well, Brian uh, McRae, not Jewish, Irish Catholic, he gets born again. And we were best friends. We did everything together. We did drugs. We did LSD. We uh, went to parties. I mean, life was about having fun. That that was our philosophy. Have as much fun as you can before you die. And that was my biggest fear, Mike, is that is that the fun would stop, that I would die one day. And that thought literally tor tormented me from the time I could think until I was late in my teen years is that one day I would die and it would all be over. But Brian was born again and became a believer in Jesus, Yeshua, and uh, began to share with us the gospel. Now, as a Jewish person, uh, the title of my testimony book is called Leave Me Alone, I'm Jewish. That was my attitude. Like, fine, Brian, that's great. You found your whatever Jesus religion. Uh, go talk to other Gentiles, but this has nothing to do with me because I'm Jewish. And, you know, the thing that's interesting, and, and we'll, we'll finish this up on, on the, the other side of the break. What's interesting is, okay, we're, we're bar mitzvahed, and for me, it was more of a social event. And I knew we did it. You, you know, your, your dad invests a certain amount f for the bar mitzvah, but then you get a certain amount that will go in your, your savings for when, you're, when you're, you're older. But you know, we, we did it as spiritually as we knew how. We just were not in a spiritually rich environment. But no one thought to say, okay, the passage you're reading in Hebrew, let's look at it in English, let's think about it, let's understand it. So we recognize our, our Judaism was, was not that deep but the same with our friends, with their Catholicism or whatever, it wasn't that deep. So when, when they met God, got born again, something radically, dramatically happens. Friends, you got to hear the rest of Ron's story. And then after you hear how he came to faith, what we're going to talk about what's happening in Israel. Can no hype, just the real deal. Not some report from a distance of some famous American preacher came in, did this, did that. I'm talking about what's happening on the streets of Israel how God is working and bringing his people to himself. We'll be right back. Welcome back, friends, to Jerusalem. I know you're not here with me, but I'm, I'm looking out on the streets of Jerusalem and just uh, everything about this place is, is amazing. Got in last night. And, and by the way, by the way, my assistant Dylan's traveling with me, but he's only here with me for two days. And then I go on to Germany. He goes back home, God willing. But we flew El Al. American Airlines into France and Paris, and then El Al, Israeli airline from Paris into uh, Tel Aviv. And El Al, of course, is famous for its security, so you get grilled. And they didn't like our story. Something wasn't meshing. Why am I going from here to Germany? Why is he going home? First time in Israel. Why is he here only two days? So very politely, they ask you questions. I think we were grilled separately for about 45 minutes until they were satisfied. I loved it. I kept telling them, thanks for doing your job. We want to feel safe. And I thought, great. My assistant Dylan gets to experience Israeli security. All right. I'm not taking any calls today. I'm sitting here with one of my dearest friends in the world, Ron Cantor. 
And Ron is on a journey now. He's come to, he's convinced that there is a God. He has a certain fear of, of death. He dies it all over. He's a teenager, lost kid, partying the whole scene. His best friend, Irish Catholic, comes to, to know the Lord, gets born again. And Brian now, Ron's best friend, is telling him about Jesus. And Ron's attitude is, that's fine for the Gentiles, fine for these others. It's, it's not for me or I. Ron, take us back on the journey. Well, and if folks uh, uh, want to share this story with their friends, uh, they just released a, a video on imetmessiah.com or .org. I'm not sure what, what it is, but uh, uh, of my testimony. It's also on YouTube at One for Israel, uh, where you can see it in English. But uh, I obviously I saw a change in Brian and in his uh, friend, Jimmy. We were all best friends, but I didn't realize that Jimmy had become a believer and had and it secretly led Brian to the Lord. And so um, I began to just hear bits and pieces. But like I said, you know, this had nothing to do with me. I'm, I, I'm Jewish. And even if I wasn't religious, I knew one thing about Judaism, and that's that we did not believe in Jesus. That was like that was the one hardcore truth that I knew. And I went with Brian and Jimmy to a bookstore. They didn't tell me at the time it was a Christian bookstore. Uh, but I was in the car and we're on the way home. And I uh, said, Brian, are you trying to tell me that if I'm not born again like you, I'm not going to heaven? Which to me seemed like the most arrogant thing anybody could ever say. And he said, yes. And God opened my eyes. When he said yes, I knew he was telling me the truth, and it it, it really scared me. And I, I yelled at him. I said, Brian, there is nothing in the New Testament about being born again. Now, what's funny about that, Mike, is that not only had I never read the New Testament, I had never fully read the Old Testament. So why would I say that? Because every person I knew in Richmond, Virginia, if they weren't Jewish, they were a quote-unquote Christian, and they never talked about being born again. Mm. Now, it's a little bit different today. We have a much more secular society. But in the 80s, growing up, you know, if you weren't Jewish, you were Christian. You went to church on Sunday, whether you were a believer or not. It's it's what you did. It was culture. And nobody ever told me about having a experiential relationship with God. So Brian, of course, opens up his Bible to John 3, 3, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. And God just convicted me. I knew it was true. It was terrifying. Because I loved my life. I loved, you know, you hear these stories. I was a drug addict. I was at the end of my road. My wife, that wasn't me. Now, maybe I would have ended up there, but I loved sin. I loved my life. I was not looking for a way out. I wasn't looking for help. I was not looking for Jesus, for sure. But I didn't want to go to hell. And I did want to know God. And Brian said, you must be born again. And for eight months, I ran from that. I was really scared. Um, and I, I was searching and yet running from it. And um, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, 1983, I decided I would fast for the first time. I thought, how can I even consider Jesus without fasting ever on Yom Kippur? So I fasted, hoping to find some sense of relationship with God, forgiveness, anything. And at the end of 24 hours, I was, other than extremely hungry, uh, I didn't feel very much at all. And a month later, I was in... Uh, I, I was in college now. I was in the only college probably uh, that would accept me. Um, I graduated high school with a 1.7 GPA. Uh, I have written more books than I read in high school. I don't know too many people that can say that. Uh, maybe you, <laughs> you're probably one of the other people that can say that. But, um, uh, you know, I was just, uh, so I got into this college. Uh, it was a junior college, and um, I was home in Richmond. I, I saw Brian, and of course, Brian is talking about Jesus. That's all he talked about. And I said, Brian, just tell me one thing. If you're, is your life better now that you believe in Jesus? Because I knew what he'd say. He'd say, Ron, of course it's not better. We, we had an awesome time. You know, We had fun. It's boring, but I'm going to go to heaven when I die. That's, that's what I thought the deal was. God rewards you for living a boring, loser life, and you get to go to heaven. And I wasn't willing. And his face lit up with joy. And he said, Ron, I know God. It wasn't what I was expecting, but I saw God in him. And I said, fine, I will go to you, to your congregation on Sunday. Call me up. He called me up. I didn't go. I went back to school. I walked in the door, and my album player, if young people out there, that's a, it's a big CD player, 
played the song Stairway to Heaven by itself. Now, I don't think there's anything holy about Led Zeppelin, but that last line, and she's buying a stairway to heaven, which was the thing that I was thinking about constantly. I called up Brian. He's like, praise God, man, I'm praying for you. I hung up on him. Two days later, I went to back to Richmond to buy. I was in the pharmaceutical business back then. I think you were at one time as well, Dr. Brown. And I, was, I would buy caffeine pills, and I would tell my friends at school that it was speed. And they would believe it. They would take it and they'd study and be all hyped up and everybody was happy. And I had a little extra spending money. And, and as we bought these, we're on our way back to school and this guy driving me, his name is Dean. And it comes, turns out that he's a believer or a backslidden believer. And I had all these questions for him. And he was, he was like an evangelist to me, even though he's backslidden. He was telling me how wonderful it was to serve God, how great it was. And I said, Dean, why would you stop? And he just said, well, I cared more about my friends, what they thought. But as we got back to school, I felt peace, a, a presence I'd never felt in my life. In 18 years, I'd never felt that. And he said, Ron, I'm taking you. He was a backslidden evangelist. And he said, I'm taking you to a movie about Jesus. We go to this movie a couple days later. At the end of the movie, we're both crying. And we are uh, on the way home. And I just said, I have to pray. I had never prayed in my life. Serious, I read prayers. But I was going to pray from my heart. And I said, God. I did not believe you were real eight months ago, but I believe you're real now. Show me how to serve you. Do I need to become a, a, an Orthodox Jew? Do I become a Christian? Do I become an, a Hindu? A Buddha? Just show me and I'll serve you. And as I'm praying, he loses control of the car. It swerves from side to side. It spins around, flips over upside down in a ditch. The car was completely a total loss. And a voice whispers in my ear, there's no Jesus. If Jesus was real, this would not have happened. And I am convinced, Dr. Brown, that a demonic power was sent to kill me right before I got born again. And he, thank God, hallelujah, thank God he did not succeed. And then he panicked and began to lie to me. I don't know. I'll find out in heaven. But we get out of the car. We're fine. We go to this house. It's the only house around. We knock on the door and two wonderful believers in Yeshua answer the door. And next thing you know, I'm sitting with them and they're sharing the gospel with me. Five minutes after I pray for God to show me the truth. And as they're sharing with me, I, I, I really didn't have blood and the cross and died from, I didn't get it. I'm a sinner. What do you mean I'm a sinner? I'm a, I'm a nice guy, you know? I didn't understand sin. But what I did understand was this power and presence that was all over my body, and it was it was increasing, and I couldn't get rid of it. And I stopped her. They were Baptists. I stopped her. I said, what is this? What? This power all over my body? And in that moment, I just said, all right, Ron, uh, you prayed. <laughs> you asked God. You're in this house. The presence of God is on you. You need to submit to this. And I was born again, and my life change dramatically after that uh, friends it, it is it is after this that i intersect with ron Cantor as as a new 18 year old believer look maybe you're listening and you're skeptical have you at least prayed god if you're real show me if this message about jesus yeshua is real show me maybe you're a jewish listener and and you're listening and say well that's an interesting story but that's not going to take us away from torah well it's actually brought Ron far back to Jewish roots and, and given him a sense and purpose that's deep enough that he, he's lived in Israel for years now. And his you know, kids served in the IDF and that he worships the God of Israel passionately. Why not pray? Say, God, if Yeshua is real, if Jesus is really the Messiah, show me. And if you show me, I'll respond. You can watch Ron's testimony at imetmessiah.com. You can watch mine as well there. And in fact, there are a lot of tremendous testimonies from every walk of life. So check those out. Be edified. We come back. We'll, we'll talk about how our lives intersected. This is Michael Brown. You're listening to The Line of Fire. And I am coming your way as promised with special guests from Jerusalem. Pray for blessing on this trip. Thanks for joining us on the line of fire. Uh, come on, say it together. Shalom. I was telling my assistant Dylan, I said, that's hello, goodbye, that works. Shalom, shalom. So here we are in Jerusalem with my dear friend, Ron Cantor. Uh, pray for fruit on this trip. I'll be speaking at a conference uh, tomorrow, God willing, and then heading over to Germany 
for a big conference there, 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And I'm not exactly sure what I'll be speaking on yet. I've got a couple of messages, but I believe one is going to tie in with Israel. It's something that was very much missed in the the Reformation and something that God certainly wants to do. So here with my friend Ron Cantor, I'm not taking your calls, but uh, as promised, coming from Jerusalem with special interviews. My friend Ron Cantor, I didn't know him at this point, but 18 years old, he gets dramatically born again. And his parents, even though... They're not religious Jews. Hey, we're Jews. We don't believe in Jesus. And you're concerned, you know, what's, what is my child going? Are they going to leave the faith? They're going to apostatize. And what about our you know, grandchildren and all the concerns that Jewish parents would have? So they, they speak to a, a rabbi, an ultra-Orthodox rabbi, who's known as a counter-missionary, uh, Dr. Emanuel Shochet. He was a professor of mysticism, actually a, a scholar in mysticism and other aspects of Judaism but also known as a strong counter-missionary. What happened with that, Ron? Well, my parents asked me to go hear him speak and then to meet with him afterwards. And I, I love my parents, so I wanted to honor them. Uh, and and Shochet, which uh, Dr. Shochet, which, uh, Rabbi Shochet, which actually means butcher in, in Hebrew, and he really was a butcher. Uh, and most Orthodox Jews are just wonderful, sweet people. He would kidnap young believers, uh, sometimes of legal age. He actually asked my parents for permission to kidnap me so they could brainwash me. Of course, I always used to, uh, to laugh and say, wait a minute, when I freely chose to believe in Yeshua, you're saying I was brainwashed, but you want to kidnap me, deprogram me, and that's not brainwashing? Anyways, my parents told him no, they would not allow me. I was 19 years old, it would have been illegal. But I did meet with him after his lecture and uh, it was very confusing. And at the end of the evening, my youth pastor, Bob Smith, who was not a scholar by any means, a strong teacher of the Bible, but not n- n- no match for uh, 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 an intellectual like like uh, Rabbi Shochet, but he just said, Rabbi, I just got one question for you. There was a girl there today that stood up at, when you were speaking, and she said, how can I know God? And you told her, go read the holy books, go read the Talmud, the Mishnah, the Bible, go read. And he said, I just got one question for you, Rabbi. Do you love your wife in your head or in your heart? He was trying to say it's about knowing God, not about knowing about God. And Shochet just looked at him, looked at me, looked at everyone else in the room, and burst into laughter and never answered the question. But I was confused, and I left that night, and I prayed. I said, God, I, I, don't, I know you're real. I know God. I know Jesus. I have a relationship with him. But can you help me out here? Just give me something. And the next day, a woman calls me up. I literally woke up to the phone ringing, and she said, Brown, my name is Betty. I work with Jews for Jesus. I had heard that you're Jewish and you'd come to faith. I want you to know you're not alone. And I thought, wow, Lord, that was that the answer? Well, I saw a friend later and said, you know what? She called me looking for your number that morning, and she said the Lord had spoken to her that morning to call you up. Mm. Well, a year later, I uh, ended up in Brooklyn because I asked my parents, I said, listen, if you can find a Jewish person who knows God, who says, I have a relationship with God, he speaks to me, I speak to him, we commune, not just, you know, Jewish people, we read from the Siddur, which means somebody wrote out all of our prayers for us all day long. We don't talk to God like you and I are conversing right now. We talk to God basically through a set, this is what you say now in the morning, this is what you say in the afternoon. And I said, and I would ask rabbis. I would literally see rabbis on the street, Mike, and I would walk up to them and just ask, do you know God? And nobody ever said yes. They, well, you can, you can learn about God. You can know it. So I said, Mom, if you can find a Jewish person who knows God, I'll go meet with him. Well, 500 miles away, she found somebody. I could have picked up the phone and had 10 people over in 10 minutes uh, that said they knew God. But I went to meet with Rabbi Scott and Rabbi Yehuda. Uh, Yehuda Fine, he's a very famous rabbi of the stars. I think he's, uh, 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 well, I won't get into other than, Other than that, he's a psychologist and a rabbi. And I met with him for four days. And it was that point that my friend Brian, if you remember him from the first segment, he led me to faith in Yeshua. Uh, he was at Christ for the Nations. Uh, Bible school in New York City, There's the or in Long Island, the famous one is in Dallas, but there was a satellite school, and you were, uh, Dr. Brown, the professor of Old Testament studies, the dean of Old Testament studies, and he, Brian hooked us up. 
And you coached me through that week. I, really, I don't know how I would have gotten through it, but you told me, just keep asking them, what about the blood? Do you need blood? Because as you know and I know now, the entire Torah is about blood sacrifice. And there's no temple. The temple's been gone. And I don't want to go too deep, but after when the, when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, a rabbi by the name of Yochanan ben Zakkai, instead of falling on his face and weeping and saying, oh my God, the temple has been destroyed. How have we sinned? What must, instead of repenting, he went into spin mode and he, and he created a brand new Judaism that didn't need any blood. He got permission from the, the emperor that was crushing the Jewish rebellion to go down to Yavne and to study there and to not be killed like a million other Jews were. And he created the Judaism that we have today where there is not an emphasis on blood sacrifice, but on good works alone. And when I met with Scott and Yehuda, the first thing they asked me to do was to, to share my testimony. And I did. And I shared it earlier on the show. And, and it was anointed. God was with us. And they said, Ron, we believe you've had an experience with God. But we believe that God, you were so turned off to religious Judaism that God used Jesus to wake you up. But now it's time to come home. Jesus is for the Gentiles. Judaism is for the Jews. Now, if I was a little bit, well, versed back then, I would have said, wait a minute. That, so, so Jesus, the Jew who was born in Bethlehem, a Jewish city, who lived his life in the Galilee, who spent much time in Jerusalem, who died on Passover, rose from the dead on the day of the first fruit sacrifice, who birthed his followers on the day of Shavuot, Pentecost, who was followed only by Jews during the... He's for the Gentiles? Anyways, I got through that week, thanks to you, Dr. Brown, and, uh, and we, we survived it, thank God. And then after that, Ron came as, as a student to our, to our ministry school. In fact, first stayed at our house for, for a week and then uh, came as a student. So we've known each other now as, as colleagues and, and co-workers. Ron's wife, Alana, actually came to faith in, in 86. I preached a message at a Messianic conference, and that's the night she was born again. So we have been close these many years. We come back. I want to talk to you about life in Israel. With Ron Cantor, what is God doing here? You've heard his story, and, and, and yes, he, he met with the counter-missionary rabbis, and they were not able to talk about his faith. Here, think of it, a young believer, new in the Lord, without the background he has now, without knowing Hebrew like he knows now, but his relationship with God was solid enough that he was able to get through that time, and now, by God's grace, stand as a witness to his people. Hey, friends, if you want to stand with me on the front lines here in Israel, and reaching out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel around the world. This is a great month to join with us and sow into our ministry. Your gift of any size this month, helping us in our Jewish outreach week, uh, uh, work, I want to send you a free book. It's 250 pages, sells for $17, reaching the cults, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons in particular. It's my thank you gift for joining with us this month with your gift of any size. Go to askdrbrown.org for more information. Welcome to Jerusalem. Can you feel that the air is different? The climate is different. What an amazing place to be. The place to which the Messiah will return when his people welcome him back. That's what we fervently wait and pray for. Michael Brown, my joy to be coming your way as promised from Jerusalem with special interviews today with one of my dearest friends in the world, Ron Cantor. We've known each other since 1984. He was a brand new Jewish believer. Uh, I helped him out when he was being uh, meeting with counter missionary rabbis that were trying to talk him out of his faith. And we've been close ever since. And if you want to hear his whole story, uh, we, we, we talked it through his, uh, his testimony. Uh, just make sure you listen to the full hour of the broadcast today. Go to the line of fire.org to listen to it. It's also been posted on the I met Messiah.com website, uh, a video testimony, but I'm here to speak at a conference in Jerusalem and Ron, something very interesting happened last night. In fact, there's a video people can see of this, but, but tell us what happened. Yeah, if they want to go to my website, messiahsmandate.org, or if you just Google Ron Cantor, you'll get there. Uh, we got to the conference last night, and there was a, 
probably 10, a dozen Orthodox Jews there. And I just want to be clear, most Orthodox Jews in Israel I get along with, even when I tell them I'm a believer. There's a small segment that are vocal against the Messianic faith. To be honest with you, most Israelis I talk to, it does not offend them at all that I'm a believer in Yeshua. So I just don't want the uh, listeners to think that this is typical, but these were their zealots and they were sent there by probably their rabbi to cause trouble at the conference. And they're screaming and they're yelling and they're cursing and they're saying the most horrible things. I, I don't want to repeat. Fortunately, they said it all in Hebrew and most of the people at the conference uh, are not Hebrew speakers. They actually walked up to them and said, uh, I said, you do understand that they don't understand you. And they didn't seem to have an impact. So they're screaming and they're starting to really disrupt the conference, even though the conference is inside, but it was a public area outside. Even the police that came uh, could not remove them because they had their freedom of speech. So Michael Mistretta, who's one of the leaders in FIRM, uh, the Fellowship of Israel Related Ministries, he finally got an idea and he brought out a loudspeaker and he hooked his iPhone up to it and started pray playing messianic praise music. Suddenly, there were probably 30 believers that were in a circle dancing and worshiping. And, and, and I got to be honest, Mike, the presence of God was stronger outside of the meeting than inside of the meeting. And as the, as the praise grew, the Orthodox Jews, and we love them. We want to see their eyes open like Paul, like Saul of Tarsus, but they got discouraged and they left. So th the presence of God did the trick. All right, so friends, if, if you want to see the video of this actually happening, and then pray for these men. They're, they're zealous. They, they think they're doing the right thing. They, they think that, that we're dangerous missionaries. The interesting thing is it's, it's basically a Christian conference, not a Jewish outreach meeting, so there, there'd be better things to, to disrupt in, in, in that regard. Uh, you know, if I was doing street evangelism or something like that. But uh, if you want to watch this, and just get a little heart for some of the dynamic of, of, of what things can be like in Israel, where there is some in, intense opposition, uh, go to messiahsmandate.org, messiahsmandate.org. And if you haven't signed up for Ron's, Ron Cantor's emails, they are informative. He often has video commentary and then uh, just really excellent newsletters on a, on a weekly basis. Ron, is, is there a, uh, an ebook people can get if they're there? Yeah, in fact, we give away a free ebook that I wrote that is very, uh, uh, lots of graphics, lots of uh, YouTube videos in it. And it's called The 15 Most Important Facts that you need to know about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It will equip believers who go to work and somebody tells them how horrible Israel is. It will tell them the truth about Israel and the truth about the so-called Palestinian nation that never existed. It will equip them to answer the uh, critics of Israel. All right, so go to messiahsmandate.org, sign up for the email list, get the free ebook. We'll be right back and talk about what God is doing here in Israel. I can't tell you what a joy it is, not just to be in Israel, but to be in Israel with a free day with my friend Ron Cantor, one of my dearest friends for many years. We spent a lot of time laughing together also. Just He's a joyous brother in the Lord, and I, I've watched with great joy to see how God's hand has been on him and his wife, Ilana, these many years. Uh, now, we're actually side by side on God TV. We each do five days a week, a five-minute show. A uh, mine called Ask Me Anything and Ron's Out of Zion, which is shot on location in different parts of Israel, informative. So we're, who would have thought of that side by side? Then, of course, I, I do a preaching show. Yeah, we gotta, gotta get your preaching show also, Ron on God TV. All right, friends, uh, as promised, coming away from Jerusalem with special interviews, I, I wanna talk realistically, Ron, about what God is doing in Israel. On the one hand, if people think, well, there's revival there and amazing things happening, a lot's happened. There were, you know, at the birth of Israel in 48, uh, only known, to, as far as we know, just literally a handful of Jewish believers were, were known in Israel at that time. Uh, we have friends now in their 30s, but when they were growing up as, as, as Jewish kids, following the Lord, following the Messiah, they were about the only Jewish kids they knew. You know, now there can be a youth conference and there are hundreds and hundreds of kids and there are you know, maybe a thousand Israeli believers and dozens of Messianic congregations. So a lot's happening. There are a lot of challenges, though. So let's first paint a realistic picture of, of what's not happening in terms of the, 
society as a whole and the growth of Orthodox Judaism. But then let's let's talk about what God's doing because He's doing amazing things. Well, Israel is a very secular society. Um, uh, maybe half of Israelis are atheist or agnostic. They don't know what they believe. Uh, they believe that they're Jewish, but they don't know what that means. And of course, we have uh, about 10, 5 to 10 percent that are what we call ultra-Orthodox Jews, uh, who their every every moment of their life is scripted out for them. And the, the better they do, then in their minds, the better off they are with God. So uh, the idea of just walking up to someone and saying, I want to tell you about Yeshua, the first thing they do is they say, you mean Yeshu which is uh, an acronym that the rabbis came up with that were against Jesus. That means may his name be blotted out forever. And I say, no, I mean Yeshua, which is Joshua. It's actually funny that in the New Testament, in English, whenever it says Jesus, it's written Jesus. But whenever it says Joshua in the book of Acts, it says Joshua. They're the exact same Hebrew words. Uh, And so, you know, as I've written in my book, Identity Theft, there has been an identity theft. We've changed the gospel to the point that when we present this incredibly Jewish story about a Jewish man prophesied by Jewish prophets who was followed by Jewish people, died on a Jewish holiday, etc., etc., followed only by Jewish people, uh, we somehow have gotten to the point where we say, if you're Jewish, you can't believe in him. So everything is stacked against us. And I think that's exactly where God likes to be. I remember Mike Bickle once said, when it comes to Israel, it's almost like God said, tie my hands behind my back, throw me in the deepest part of the ocean and watch me survive. In other words, it looked, did anyone believe Israel could ever be a nation after the Holocaust? Six million Jews murdered, the ones who survived broken, and yet three years later, Israel, the prophecies about the Jewish nation coming to life again came to, but it's also going to happen with the Jewish people. It says in Ezekiel 37, it speaks about two prophecies. The first prophecy is the, the dry bones coming together and becoming bodies, but then he prophesies a second time and they get life. And I really believe Jewish people coming back to the land, it's great, it's wonderful, but if there's no life in them, what's the point? We need to get to the second prophecy where God begins to breathe life in the Jewish people like he has with me, with you, with our wives, and and, and more and more in this country. So what is happening now? Mike, I really believe that we're on the verge of something special here. Uh, I was sharing at my congregation, where we have a Hebrew-only congregation in Tel Aviv called Tiferet Yeshua. Everything we do is in Hebrew. There's no English, there's no Russian, there's no Spanish. And and that's by design because we want to reach native-born Israelis with the message of Yeshua. And I was preaching on Friday out of John 2, where Yeshua turns the water into wine. And, you know, it's a beautiful picture of us. We are clay's jars of clay. That's what, what, what Paul calls us. And we are filled with water. Water is water, right? But when the Holy Spirit comes on us, that water is turned to wine supernaturally. And that, and wine is a, a type of the Holy Spirit. And God wants to turn our water into wine. And it's funny at the end of that passage, the master of the ceremonies tastes the wine and he says, to the, to the bridegroom, by the way, the bridegroom is Yeshua in, in terms of the, the, the ultimate analogy. And he said, most people serve the good stuff first and they save the cheap stuff for last, but you have saved the best for last. And I believe that the revival coming to Israel is going to be greater even than the book of Acts. And, and Romans 11 says that when the Jewish people accept the Messiah, it's going to mean greater riches for the Gentiles, verse 11, and life from the dead, verse 15. So, enough preaching. A a few months ago, some of our young people, uh, they began to watch some videos of Todd White, who's an evangelist in America, uh, who is just a a fearless signs and wonders evangelist and goes out on the streets, prays for sick people, they get healed, and then they hear about Yeshua. And so these two uh, young 20-something-year-old Israeli believers, they saw that and they just said, "We, we can do that right? If he can do that, we can do it. And they begin to go out on the streets of Tel Aviv and just ask people, uh, are you sick? Are you hurting? Is there any pain in your body? And almost everyone they prayed for got instantly healed. 
And if they didn't get healed, they prayed again, and then they got healed. And then they were able to share the gospel with people. Well, as, as they came to the congregation and, and so excitingly shared their testimony, then others began to go out. Then it spread to other congregations. Now they have a, a WhatsApp group where they say, we're going out on this night at this time, and they go out and they just pray for people. The Bible says that the word is confirmed with signs and wonders, and signs and wonders also confirm the word. And so we have seen, um, there's a video I watched the other day, and I know Israelis. I love Israelis. These are my people, especially Tel Aviv. And when I'm looking, I was in tears as I'm looking at people in Tel Aviv. I know how they think, how they, how cynical they are. And I'm watching a woman get healed of, of back issues, somebody get healed of neck issues, and they're in tears, and they're amazed, and they can't believe it. And then they're hearing and receiving the gospel. Just a few weeks ago, we had a young man. He came to our congregation. Do, how much time do we have? Okay, so we had a young man. He came to our congregation because a friend of his that he grew up was born again. She got born again because she had searched. She was like the woman with the issue of blood. She had been tormented all her by, all her life by demons, and she could never find freedom until she came to our congregation. She got born again. They took her to be immersed in water in the Jordan River, and she something came over her. She could barely get into the river. When they finally got her in the river and they immersed her in the name of Yeshua, when she came up, she started screaming as the Lord was setting her free free from demonic powers. And my friend Moti, Pastor Moti, he is not given to exaggeration. He is not a super spiritual guy. He said, Ron, at that point, the fish, now if you're in the Jordan River, they'll nibble and at you. It's a little weird. He said they began to bite us. And he said, Ron, the only thing I could think of was the story of the pigs where the demons went into the pigs and they ran into the water and, and killed themselves. Well, she told her friend about this. He comes to the congregation. He's got one foot bigger than the other. I don't mean some of the silly things that we've seen on TV. I mean, literally, he wears a attachment on his foot be, and, and walks with a limp because one foot leg is longer I said foot one leg is one, longer than the other one foot that would be weird too so, <laughs> so his leg is longer than the other um and they pray for him and his leg grows out to the point that he has to take off the attachment and he is a, he's an unbeliever God wants to heal unbelievers. You know, I just want to challenge people listening. If you're saying, oh man, we haven't seen healing in so long, stop praying for people in your church, in your congregation, and go out to the streets and pray for the unsaved, and you will see miracles. Just the other day, I was in my hotel room, and a guy walks in to clean the room. I say, hey, what's your name? Mah Mahmoud. I said, what's what's going on with you? He said, well, my, my knee is in constant pain. I said, let me pray for you. I prayed for his knee. It was instantly healed. Healed. And uh, as I began to, uh, 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 he couldn't believe it. And he said to me, he's, he said, the pain is gone. The pain is gone. The next day he comes to the room and, and my wife's in there and he, and she's, he says, you got to thank your husband. You know that I have had no knee pain for 24 hours. This morning I saw him because he's Muslim. Mahmoud, he's Muslim. I said, Mahmoud, I know you don't believe in Jesus, but you got to see this video. And I showed him a video from CFAN, Daniel Kalenda's ministry, of a Muslim man who was deaf, ended up at a at a uh, a, a campaign of Daniel Kalenda in Ghana, Africa. And God, when Daniel began to play, he didn't know where he was. He did not know he was at a gospel campaign until Daniel said, deaf ears open, and his ears open, and he flipped out. He goes up on the stage and he says, somebody go tell my wife, because he's from another city, my name is Muhammad such and such, I live here, go tell her that Jesus is the son of God. So that is what God is doing in Israel. Friends, same God same gospel same spirit luke 9 yeshua sends his disciples out and says preach the kingdom of god is here and then heal luke 10 he says go heal and then say the kingdom of god is here the kingdom of god is spreading and advancing even in the midst of the skeptics in israel god's on the move friends are you praying for israel what a joy to be here in israel in jerusalem michael brown Thanks for praying for us. I had a great trip over. My assistant Dylan got to experience El Al security in Paris. We were probably talked to you for about 45 minutes, examining our stories. And they separate you. They will check the stories, go back and forth. And it, 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 they have little conferences between them because they they got to be sure. Got to be sure that they are not letting the wrong people on the plane or into Israel. 
now sitting with my friend Ron Cantor. If you missed any of the broadcasts, go to thelineoffire.org. Just click on Listen Later Today, or you can do what I did. I have the app, the Line of Fire app, on my cell phone. If you have an Apple phone, if you have an iPhone or Android, Samsung, any of the major carriers, uh, go to, to, the, to the Play Store, the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, download the app. So type in Line of Fire with Dr. Michael Brown, and you can listen to two hours live wherever you are, anywhere in the world. So I was in Israel, flipped it on, and there it was loud and clear, clearer than on my radio. You can listen to all the past shows there, connect with our website. It is a terrific, terrific place to be. By the way, before I get back with Ron just for a few more minutes here, uh, he mentioned that the religious Jews or your average person on the street of Israel refers to Yeshua as Yeshu. Now, there's a linguistic argument that it originally was pronounced Yeshua, and the, it's an ayin at the end that's not pronounced in, in modern Hebrew today. And that at a certain point, the final ah uh, was kind of lost in Yeshu. And, and so you, you lost that final ayin, and you ended up just with Yeshu. But Yeshu is three letters in Hebrew, Yud, Shin, Vav. And the rabbis made that into an acronym, Yimach Shemo Vizichro, may his name and memory be obliterated. But it's actually spelled differently. There's a missing letter at the end of the word. So we say, no, 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 that's not his real name. This is his real name. And of course, it's related to the word for, Yesh- for salvation, which is Yeshua. So the name Yeshua, salvation, Yeshua. And we're saying, hey, this is who he really is. So there's a, it's not just introducing who he is, the name, everything has to be overcome. God is moving in the midst of this, and uh, miracles are happening as people are going out in the streets praying for the sick. Uh, Ron mentioned a woman set free from demons. She invites her friend to a service. The guy's got one leg longer than the other. He actually has a a supplement of one shoe uh, so that he can actually walk properly. He gets healed, doesn't need that, and then he gets born again. Even in Israel, God can work. But Ron, when you first got here, uh, it, it... you're, you're always outgoing evangelist, very free to share your faith. What happened? Well, you know, when, when I came to faith, I was, I was a lunatic for Jesus <laughs> to the point that I, I sometimes it was problematic. It wasn't always good. And, you know, the Bible talks about having zeal without wisdom. The problem is this, is that we go to a zealous person without wisdom, and instead of giving him wisdom, we pour fu- water on their fire and take away their zeal. Um, and I remember years ago, somebody said to me, uh, that, you know, as you get older, you get wiser, you don't, you don't have to be so excited. I think it's the opposite. I am more excited today about the gospel of Yeshua than I've ever been. But I have to admit, when I moved to Israel, you get a little gun shy. You, 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 how are they going to respond? What, what happens when they find out? I'm pretty good about telling people that I'm a believer and seeing where it goes. But at the end of the day, it's words against words. I remember T.L. Osborne's testimony. He goes to India as a young missionary, not spirit-filled, and, and he begins to share about Jesus with these Hindus and Muslims, and they're nice people, and he was expecting them to come to the Messiah, but they didn't because they also had words. He had words, and they had words, and he comes back to America dejected. That's where he met Gordon Lindsay, the father of Shira Sokaram, whom I work with, her and Ari here in Israel, and other healing evangelists, and he gets filled with the Holy Spirit, goes back to India, packs a a, a stadium with 60,000 people, and he says, we saw more miracles than we'd ever seen before. See, that's the the defining thing, the the, um, uh, not common denominator, the outliers, when you begin to bring miracles to the equation, nobody can argue with a miracle. They can argue with an argument, but you can't argue with a disc in a back that is suddenly healed or a broken arm like we saw yesterday in Jerusalem uh, that was healed. And, and let me just say this. The power is in the, the gospel. We understand that. The word of God is anointed. You preach the word. It's anointed. God convicts hearts. But God confirms his word. This is God saying Jesus has risen from the dead. This is the Holy Spirit, not just convicting a, a heart, but also healing a body. It's, it's both And yes, people get saved without a miracle, but in point of fact, throughout history and right to this day, the miracle, it's a sign of God's love. It's a sign of God's nearness. It's a sign of what you just heard is real. And it it can work in the Hindu world. It can work in the Muslim world. It can work in the Jewish world. In fact, it started in the Jewish world. 
Right. And if you look at the ministry of Yeshua, obviously he used miracles to get people's attention. You know, he didn't have to feed the 5,000. I mean, ultimately they would have all found food elsewhere. They weren't going to starve to death, but he did a miracle to say, hey, this is real. He raised the dead, not just to raise the dead, but for a per. And when we see miracles in Jerusalem, over the past week, we've seen so many uh I don't even have time to talk about it. Just to say this, we're not doing it to say, hey, wow, look at us. We want to see people born again, Jews and Arabs alike. And I am just, I really believe we're on the verge of something special. And I, I, God is going to use the young believers in this nation to do signs, wonders, and miracles. The Jews, we seek a sign. That, that is who we are. And God is giving us a, a, a sign. And what Paul says is the Greek seeks wisdom, Jews seek a sign, but we preach Messiah crucified, right? To the lost, it's, it's, it's foolishness, it's a stumbling block, but to the believer, to those who believe, it's the power of God and the wisdom of God. So we preach this message, which to the intellect is foolish, and then God backs it. That's the whole thing. God backs it with his power. Hey, friends, I want to encourage you to pray for Israel to pray for God, to open the hearts and minds of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Ron and I believe in, in the importance of the modern state of Israel, but above all, we know the most important thing is seeing our people come to faith in Jesus, Yeshua. So connect with Ron. His website is messiahsmandate.org. There are tons of informative videos, teachings there. When you sign up for his newsletter, he'll, he'll send you a free ebook on 15 facts about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that, that uh, you would not know about or you may hear misreported. Very, very helpful. A great material on a weekly basis. And, and Ron, we've just got a, a minute. Are there guidelines? Are there things on the website that will help people to know how to pray, how to stand with Israel, or your weekly newsletters, and you write every time? Will that be helpful? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you sign up for a newsletter, you don't just get a free book, but you get the newsletter. <laughs> and We send those out a couple times a week, and it will help you uh, to pray, but it's also going to motivate you, excite you as you hear about what God is doing in this country. So, And, and we thank you, because I'll be honest with you, it was through the Jewish people that the church was birthed, but it's going to be through the church that revival is going to be rebirthed in this country.